Well, good morning, Faith family. Welcome to episode five of This We Believe as we are walking through the Apostles' Creed uh, in this book, This We Believe, by uh, Dr. Timothy Tennant, president of Asbury Theological Seminary. I hope that you've enjoyed this study thus far. Uh, we're nearing our end, and so we're on the, the latter part of the Apostles' Creed, which is one of the most fundamental um, creedal documents uh, of the church. And so... Um, so glad that you're joining us. Uh, Candy, good morning. Thanks for being here. Reminder that this is going to go live. It's live on Facebook. It'll go, it'll post later in the day. And then we'll post this up on YouTube if you'd like to share this with uh, family or friends and for them to join along as we delve into the creed. And so um, as usual, I'm going to lead us in the creed this morning. I'm going to pray for us. And then uh, we're going to delve into some pretty interesting topics. You're going to want to stick around for this. So um, let's, uh, let's uh, say the creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person who is watching this. God, I pray that you would help us delve deeper into our understanding of you. And God, come to a greater appreciation of your love and your grace and your mercy for us. And Lord, we just uh, we pray for all of those who are in harm's way, Lord, with the storm that's bearing down on, uh, on us, uh, just east of us. And Lord, I just pray that you would watch over their lives and their properties. And um, Father, uh, we, we lift them up to you this morning. Pray this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. I hope you all are staying safe where you are. Fortunately, it looks like us uh, east or west of Houston is not going to get nearly the brunt of the storm that uh, they were thinking we were earlier in the week. But my goodness, as somebody who's lived through Hurricane Katrina, uh, was ground zero for Hurricane Katrina in South Mississippi, watching this storm turn into a Category 4 this morning, uh, later this morning, uh, is it's a, it's a heavy it's, it's a heaviness on me because I've, I've been on the other side of that. So please be praying for those folks. Well, um, we are going to jump in first into the chapter that covers, From Thence He Shall Come to Judge the Quick and the Dead. And in this chapter, Dr. Tennant says that all too often churches have a home on the range service, where he <laughs> describes that seldom is heard a discouraging word. He talks about how we uh, tend to, in church, we, we want to... We want to just encourage, and by just encouraging, we skip some of the tougher parts of Scripture. And there are some parts of Scripture that are not as fun to talk about, and talking about God judging people is one of those things. You know, back when I was doing uh, my YouTube days uh, in ministry, I filmed a video called We Believe in God But Not the Bible, and it was the intention of it was to show the hypocrisy that we tend to pick and choose parts of Scripture that we best align with while jettisoning or crossing out or ignoring the parts that we find uncomfortable. So the video title was catchy, but it was supposed to lead you through this understanding that we cannot hold this hypocritical um, uh, stance when it comes to Scripture. Well, you know how many times people commented on that video before ever watching it, just based on the title? That was like seven, eight years ago. Like last week, I still had people commenting uh, about the video without actually watching it. So, uh, but the point is, we have to talk about the stuff that is inspiring and we, we take to heart along with the stuff that goes, wow, makes me have to think about life and God in a deeper way. And so uh, we're going to talk about, from thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And we're going to talk about judgment. Uh, but let's take a look at what all this all means. He shall come, that part of the creed. It refers to the second coming of Christ. Now, Matthew 24, 30 says, Then he will appear, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. 
So Matthew describes the moment like when your wife comes home and simultaneously you are excited to see her while panicked when you think, did I do the dishes? And you run to the kitchen and try to scramble everything before she sees a messy kitchen. It's that kind of uh, a moment. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 16 says, According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven the loud command and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will ever we will be with the Lord forever. Now, in this chapter, Dr. Tennant, he advocates a one single unified return of Christ. And in that, he dismisses the idea of a rapture where we are raptured up and then there's a period of time that passes before Jesus fully comes back to earth. Now, I'm about to weigh in on what is not one, not two, not three, but four theologically held positions that the church has at different points in our 2000 year history has embraced as a way to read about this eschatology, this second coming of Christ. Now, I've said this before, that the deeper you get into theology, the looser you begin to hold things because you realize that there is a whole lot more out there than you, than you realize. Uh, you know, as Methodists, we evaluate uh, theological thoughts through what is called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And that Wesleyan quadrilateral, it's not to say that all four parts are equal. I like to think of it more as a pyramid. But that through uh, these four th ways, we interpret theological positionings. Uh, so number one is scripture. Number two is tradition. Number three is reason. And number four is experience. And so we look through these lenses to evaluate theological positions. So we look at what scripture says. We look at what the church, 2,000 years of church tradition has weighed in on this. And we look at reason because God gave us minds to think and God had gives us experiences with the Holy Spirit to help interpret what we are reading. And so, with that being said, I want you to understand that um, we, I like to look at what the whole church for 2,000 years has said on particular theological topics, including the, uh, the very confusing one of eschatology. You know, when you read Revelation, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. And, uh, but it's helpful to go back and see what did the early church say about Revelation and the second coming of Jesus and the end of times. And so, uh, like I said, there's not one, there's not two, there's not three. There are four historically held theological positions of the church that the church has moved between these over the course of time over eschatology. And so the first one is probably the one you are most familiar with. It's the one that I was taught growing up, and I did not know that there were other ones until I went to seminary and realized that there were other positions that the church has held throughout its 2,000-year history. But the first one is called dispensational premillennialism. Now, dispensational premillennialism holds that Christ will come before a seven-year period of intense tribulation to take his church, the living and the dead, into heaven. After this period of fulfillment of divine wrath, he shall then return to rule from a holy city, the New Jerusalem, over the earthly nations for 1,000 years. In these 1,000 years, Satan, who will be bound up during Christ's earthly reign, will be loosened after those 1,000 years, will be loosened to deceive the nations, gather an army of the deceived, and take up, take up to battle against the Lord. This battle will end in both judgment of the wicked and Satan and the entrance into the eternal state of glory by, righteous, by the righteous. This view is called premillennialism because it places the return of Christ before the millennium, and it's called dispensational because it is founded in the doctrines of dispensationalism. Let's get into what some of the particulars of this mean. This position holds that both Israel and the church uh, are two distinct identities with two distinct an individual redemptive plan. So you've got the redemption of Israel through one means and the redemption of the church through another means. Uh, 
they believe in the rapture of the church. So the church is raptured before the seven-year tribulation time. And this tribulational period uh, contains the reign of the Antichrist. This position holds the millennium, um, that Christ will return at the end of this great tribulation to institute a thousand-year rule from the holy city, meaning the new Jerusalem. And those who come to believe in Christ during the seventh uh, week of Daniel, including the 144,000 Jews, uh, and survive will go on to populate the earth in this time. Now, those who are raptured or raised previously to the tribulation period will reign with Christ over the millennial population. Now, this, uh, this interpretation uh, raises to higher degrees present-day events in light of end times prophecy. So you'll hear people talk about the signs of the times. The millennium will see the reestablishment of temple worship and sacrifice as a remembrance to Christ's sacrifice. So during the thousand year period of time people sin, then we will go back to a sacrificial system of animals in the temple in the New Jerusalem. And then from the millennial ending, the white throne judgment will take place. And at the white throne judgment, uh, Satan and all unbelievers will be thrown into the lake of fire and Christ and all the saints will proceed into eternal glory. Now, if this sounds familiar to you, it's probably because this is what uh, the Left Behind series that came out back in the late uh, 1990s and early 2000s uh, espoused. I read a lot of those books at the time. Of course, uh, that was around the time that 9-11 hit, and so life got a little too real, and so I, uh, I had to put the, the series down at the time. So this is what I was taught growing up, which is probably what you've heard growing up. Uh, now, this is where history gets interesting. This particular theological stance of premillennial dispensationalism did not come about until 1866, when a guy by the name of James Inglis introduced this in a small publication called the Believer's Meeting for Bible Study. Now, one of the readers of that publication was an evangelist at the time named Dwight L. Moody. Now, Dwight L. Moody was one of the most famous evangelists in American history, and he began to espouse this theology. And because he, being this leading evangelist, espoused this theology, it wove its way into a Bible that was popular at the time. It was called the Schofield Reference Bible. It was the number one selling Bible at the turn of the 20th century. And so um, this theology was thought to combat Christian liberalism, which was just rampant throughout seminaries and moving across denominations, especially mainline denominations. And so... This theology was thought as a uh, combatant to that Christian liberalism. Now, dispensations, when you talk about dispensations, uh, that theology is wrapped in the idea that God deals with humans in different ways at different points in history. And so it starts off with innocence in the garden. It goes to having a conscience after the uh, sin enters the picture, moving on to the, the time frame of government's ruling. And then there's the promise of uh, covenants and the with Abraham, and then it moves into the law with Moses, and then under Jesus we are under grace, and then finally at the end of the time it's this millennial reign of Christ. So God deals differently with humanity through these different dispensations. Now it's grown immensely in popularity in America. Not necessarily the rest of Christianity around the world, but American Christianity has been profoundly shaped in the 20th century by this particular theological viewpoint, with Dallas Theological Seminary being one of the main proponents of this theology. So that's number one. I need to take a sip of water. If you have questions, I'm going to try to answer them, so leave those in a comment down below. I'm doing a better job this week with the way my setup is to be able to see your comments as you're leaving them. And good morning to all of you. So glad that you're joining. We're getting pretty deep this morning. Um, so number two, number two is historic premillennialism. And historic premillennialists place the return of Christ just before the millennium and just after a time of great apostasy and tribulation. Now, after the millennium, Satan will be loosed and Gog and Magog will rise against the kingdom of God. This will be immediately followed by the final judgment. While similar in some respects to dispensational variety, in that they hold to Christ's return being previous to the establishment of a thousand-year earthly reign, historical premillennialism differs in significant ways, most notably in their method of interpreting Scripture. So when it comes to Israel and the church, historic premillennialism 
uh, believes that the church is the fulfillment of Israel, whereas premillennial dispensationalism sees that the Israel and the church have two separate salvific tracks. Historic premillennialism, excuse me, these are big words, believes that the church is the fulfillment of Israel and that the kingdom of God is present through the Spirit since Pentecost. So since the Holy Spirit has come uh, at Pentecost, we are living in the kingdom of God, but it's to be experienced by sight, not just as a spiritual reality, but by sight during the millennium after Christ returns. So when Christ is here, then we see the full ushering in of the kingdom of God. Now, this position believes that the rapture meaning the saints, the living and the dead, shall meet the Lord in the clouds immediately preceding the millennial reign. Uh, and Tennant goes into this chapter a little bit more about, like, it's a once event. We meet Jesus as Jesus is coming down, and we then come back to earth with Christ. There's not a seven-year lag between us meeting Jesus and then disappearing for seven years and then coming back. Historic premillennialism holds that the rapture is a singular event with Christ's second coming. Now, in this, the millennium, uh, Christ will return to institute a thousand-year reign on earth, so that's similar to the uh, premillennial dispensationalism. And the millennium will see the reestablishment of temple worship and sacrifice as a remembrance of Christ's sacrifice. So there's some similarities there between the first and second theological positions. Now, some of the early church fathers held this view. So some of the people closest to the time of Jesus believed in this uh, in the first few centuries of the church. And this is what Dr. Tennant is espousing, um, is this pre historic premillennialism. So that's number two. Number three is postmillennialism. The postmillennialism believes that the millennium is not an era, not a literal thousand years during which Christ will reign over the earth not from a literal and earthly throne, but through the gradual increase of the gospel and its power to change lives. Over this gradual Christ Christianization of the world, Christ will return and immediately usher the church into their eternal state after judging the wicked. This is called post-millennial because by its view, Christ will return after the millennium. So basically, post-millennialism sees that the, the church has done its job so very well that we have Christianized the whole world, and I mean, we've lived into the kingdom of God at that point, and Jesus then returns after the church has done its job. As far as Israel and the church, they also believe that the church is the fulfillment of Israel. As far as the kingdom of God, they believe it is a spiritual entity experienced on earth through the Christian, Christianizing effect of the gospel. So uh, it's just the steady ramp up of the kingdom of God through people's faith. In the millennium, they believe uh, the golden age previous to Christ's second advent during which Christ will vi virtually rule over the whole earth through an unprecedented spread of the gospel that a large majority of the people will be Christian. It's not a literal thousand years. It's a figurative time period in which the church uh, does its job. Now, post-millennialism was very popular among American evangelicals in the period of unprecedented technological growth between 1870 and 1915. Well, what happened in 1915? World War I was a thing. And World War I served to squash this tremendous optimism regarding the growth of technology and the optimism around the future of man. I mean, we saw the darkest parts of ourselves emerge in the 20th century. Uh, and so that was carried over into the church and that form of optimistic eschatology, and that kind of came crumbling down. And this around the same time as the um, uh, pre uh, dispensational premillennialism is taking off as they're seeing the world kind of just falling apart and people going, see, the signs of the times. And so it's interesting how history has interacted with the theological thought of the church at various points in time. Fourth, number four, amillennialism. Now, the amillennialism believes that the kingdom of God was inaugurated at Christ's resurrection, hence the term inaugurate, inaugurated millennialism, at which point uh, Jesus gained victory over Satan and the curse, which is sin. Christ is now reigning, hence the term nunc millennialism, nunc meaning now, um, 
and he's reigning at the right hand of the Father over the church. We've talked about that already in previous episodes. Well, after this present age has ended, Christ will return and immediately usher in usher the church into their eternal state after judging the wicked. The term amillennialism uh, is actually a misnomer for it implies that Revelation 21 through 6 is ignored. In fact, amillennialist hermeneutic interprets it, in fact, much of the apocalyptic literature as non-literal. So amillennialism believes that since Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus has conquered everything, we are living into the millennial right now. So it's not like a literal thousand years, but this is what I mean, we're living into the reign of Christ as we speak. As far as Israel and the church is concerned, the church is the eschatology, blah, 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 speak for a living. Uh, the church is the fulfillment of Israel, just as the way as, uh, positions two and three hold as well. As far as the kingdom of God, they believe it's a spiritual reality that all Christians partake in and that it is seen presently by faith, but will be grasped by sight at the consummation when Jesus finally returns. Uh, the rapture, under this view, uh, is that the saints, the living and the dead, shall meet with the Lord in the clouds and immediately proceed to, the, to judge nations when Christ, uh, and then follow him into their eternal state. As far as the millennium, uh, it's inaugurated with Christ's resurrection. So it's, it's already happened 2,000 years ago in this view. Uh, it's this already but not yet sense. Uh, Christ already reigns. Overall, and is already victor victorious over Satan. Now, um, this position has higher degrees of interpreting prophecy in light of Christ's advent and death, resurrection, and glorification. But what's fascinating is that amillennialism has been the majority position of the church, the global church, over the course of 2,000 years. So it's fascinating to see where the church has landed at different points in our history. And as Methodists, you can hold any one of these four and be considered a faithful Methodist. We're a big umbrella when it comes to theological interpretation. I'm curious what has shaped you and what your thoughts are. I've struggled with this uh, as far as which one makes most sense to me biblically. Um, I do understand Revelation is a difficult book to read, and anybody who can say that they've got it fully figured out, um, it's, it's prophecy, it's apocalyptic prophecy, and anybody who can say definitively that they've got Revelation figured out is probably trying to sell you on their book. Now, in this line of the Apostles' Creed, it talks about God judging. And scripture talks about the judgment seat of God. Now, I misspoke in an episode previous uh, where I said that uh, there is no resurrection of the unjust. Uh, John 5, 28 through 29 says, Do not be amazed by this, for a time is coming when all men in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good to rise to live, and those who have done what is evil to rise to be condemned. So there will be a physical reunification even with those who aren't in Christ. Um, but that one day everybody will stand before Jesus and be judged. Romans 14, 10 says, You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Romans 2, 16 says, This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. Are you nervous about that? <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, Luke 12, 2 through 3 says, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not, not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops. And so one day, everything we've done will be brought to light. And we're gonna get into what that looks like for, for, for people. But Tenet says, crucial, Crucial to the biblical doctrine of God's love is that all things will eventually be set right. Love without justice is mere sentimentality. And so um, all will be judged. Those in faith will go on to be with the Lord, whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, meaning that Jesus has covered their sin, that by uh, grace through faith, we have appropriated Jesus' toning sacrifice for ourselves. Therefore, we are covered. Our sins are paid for. 
They will be exposed. We will see what we've done. But ultimately, it is the blood of Jesus that will have covered all of our sins and mistakes. Thanks be to God. But those who have rejected Jesus and his atoning sacrifice for their life will, e will either go to A, the eternal torment, B, annihilation, or C, the testing of flames into perfection. You can reference back, I believe it was episode two? I believe it was episode two or three? Uh, where we talked about the different uh, interpretations of hell. And so those are kind of the main three theological interpretations of hell. So um, they're going to go off into judgment, uh, whereas we will go off into be, be in eternity with Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15 says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through flames." So basically, anything out of God that we've done in our lives that's not of faith is going to just evaporate. It's going to burn up. Yet grace will meet us and take us forward. So even for those of us in Christ, when we stand before Jesus and all, everything we've done is exposed, the good things we've done and the things that people thought were good, but maybe we had ill intent in doing them, all of that motivation is going to be there. And so it's all going to get stripped away. If it's not faith, it's not in Christ, it's all going to get stripped away. And Paul says that, you know, even if, even if some of what you've built in your life gets stripped away, you will still be saved if you are found in Christ at that point. That's a lot. That's a lot to cover. So if you've got questions, leave them down below. I see that we've got a lot of folks that are, that are watching. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you don't have questions at this point, I'm going to go on to the next chapter, which is I believe in the Holy Spirit. Now, a few years ago, I got invited to go have a conversation with some um, Christian pilots who had done a lot of missionary work in Africa. And they bring supplies to very remote villages in Africa. And they were talking about how to spread the gospel. And they, they said one of the biggest challenges they face in Africa is prosperity theology. And that's the idea that God wants all people to be healthy and prosperous if we just had enough faith. Well, that's very difficult for people who are living on less than a dollar a day to hear that if they just had enough faith, they would be richer and out of poverty. And so that's where, you know, American prosperity gospel that's just been embedded in our culture and uh, that's where it breaks down. When you, when you can't apply that theology to other Christians in other places of the world, that's when you realize that maybe your theology isn't biblical. Um, and so, but yet it is such a prominent theological thought in Africa and it really has hampered the growth of the gospel because if you're preaching, hey, if uh, God wants you to be rich and prosperous, you know, just have enough faith and you'll be rich and prosperous, yet you live in a very poor community People aren't going to buy into that because they're going to look at the people who say they believe in Jesus but aren't living any richer than anybody else. And so the, it breaks down the argument that they need to come to Christ. But one of the pilots, he talked about the need for a better and simpler theology. He passing, passingly made a reference that the Africans don't even need to even understand the Trinity. They just need Jesus. And that struck me wrong. Because how do you leave off one of the three persons of the Trinity? Tennant says that the Trinity is not some kind of speculative doctrine that only theolog uh, theologians discuss. The Trinity lies at the heart of our faith and worship. Without the Trinity, all of the core of doctrines of Christianity become incoherent. So what is your concept of the Holy Spirit? And where have you seen the Holy Spirit at work in your life? I used to think uh, that the Holy Spirit was that kind of crazy uncle that we all have but we never speak of. Um, yet the Holy Spirit is the person of God who indwells in us. The Holy Spirit is our connection with God. 
You know, uh, when I was going, when I was starting off uh, in the candidacy process to be a Methodist pastor, the, the pastor that was mentoring me, he had this statue of three persons. There were wooden carved statue of three persons, and it was all built out of one solid piece uh, of wood, yet they were interlocking, uh, meaning that they were completely separate um, people, but they all interlocked and they could move back and forth together, but they were carved out of one piece of wood. And I, I remarked that that was such an amazing uh, piece of art. And he said, that's the way the Trinity is, this interlocking three in one circle that we get brought into and they're bound together, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are bound together in love and that we get brought into this loving relationship of the Godhead and the Holy Spirit being the tether that brings us in because we are connected to God through the Holy Spirit. Now, Tennant, um, Tennant says the Puritans used to say that God in himself is a sweet society, but Islam teaches that God is solitary and has no interest in revealing himself to us. He says that Hinduism believes that the highest concept of God is abstract and impersonal, and Buddhism does not believe in an ultimate God, only lesser enlightened beings. But the Trinity is unique to the Christian proclamation. And the Holy Spirit, friends, the Holy Spirit meets us where we are. Isaiah 57, 15 says, For this is what the high and exalted one says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And so the Holy Spirit is the author of prevenient grace. Ephesians 2, 1 says, As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. Apart from the Holy Spirit convicting us, uh, showing us that prevenient grace that we even need Jesus to begin with, apart from that, we would never come to Christ. And so that's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is showing that prevenient grace to everybody, wooing them to Jesus over the course of their life. The Holy Spirit is also, also the author of sanctifying grace. Galatians 5, through 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against, against such things there is no law. And so Tennant says, if you are a Christian, you had no power to open the door to your heart to Jesus without the prompting and enablement of the Holy Spirit. And it is through the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we grow, go on to have that love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit giving us this grace that sanctifies us in this life. Now, Paul also says that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. In one of my favorite passages in Scripture, Romans 8, 26 through 27, it says this, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. I love that, that even when you don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit is praying for you. That's part of the role of the Holy Spirit who is indwelling your life to take up those requests and make them known to the Father. And the Holy Spirit also guides us. Romans 8, 14 says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Galatians 5, 18 says, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. There have been many times in my life where I've had that like Holy Spirit nudge where God just is leading you to do something. And often I tell people that you can tell it's the Holy Spirit leading you when it's something that you wouldn't otherwise choose for yourself. If it's something that you wouldn't otherwise want to do, but it's something that's good, it's just rather uncomfortable, you pretty much bet that that's the Holy Spirit nudging you in your life. I once had a, a situation where I was doing hospital visits and I left the hospital room that I was visiting and I went down and as I exited the, the elevator, I looked to my left and there was the waiting room. And uh, I always check the waiting room to see if there was somebody that I knew or recognized in there. And as I passed by the waiting room, there was a man uh, whose head was down and it looked as if he was crying. Well, as I walked by, I felt the Holy Spirit say, go pray for him. And I said, no. 
and I kept walking. I, I thought and reasoned with God, they have hospital chaplains. It's a Catholic hospital. That's what they do. That's their job is to pray for people like this. And as I got most of the way back to the entrance of the hospital, the Holy Spirit yet again said, stop, turn around and go pray for the man. So I stopped and I turned around, but as I was making a deal with God, because I didn't want to just awkwardly walk up and ask the man if I could pray for him, I ducked into what used to be the gift shop. Now I hadn't been to that hospital in a little while, and as I walked into the gift shop, I started looking through the glass to peer in, and through the glass to see if the guy was maybe just having allergies or something. I, just, I wanted to assess the situation. So I'm standing in what I thought was the gift shop, looking out at the man, and the woman behind the desk says, sir, can I help you? Well, I look up and realize that they renovated the gift shop, and it no longer was a gift shop. It was a lactation specialty store. So I looked at the woman, I saw what was in the store, and without thinking, I said, no thanks, ma'am, I'm just looking. So then I felt obligated to take a walk around the store and pretend to be interested in this lactation specialty paraphernalia. I finished walking around the store, said thank you to the woman, and immediately walked over to the man sitting there crying because at this point, God clearly needed me to go pray for him. And I was like Jonah. I just gave up and went and did what I was asked to do. I walked up to the man. I said, sir, I'm a pastor. Can I pray for you? And he looked at me and said, yes, please. He wasn't from our country. He was somewhere from Europe. And so through uh, English clearly wasn't his first language. But he said, my wife has been taken back to have our first child, but there's complications, and so they sent me out. Would you pray for us? So I laid my hand on his shoulder, and I started to cry as I prayed for him and his wife and his unborn child. The Holy Spirit nudges us, leading us to do things we wouldn't otherwise choose for ourselves. And the Holy Spirit, lastly, extends the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. It is through the spirit of God that the kingdom that Jesus talked about is built on this earth as it is in heaven. It's through that kind of happening where the Holy Spirit nudges you and prompts something inside of you that the, the kingdom that Jesus is trying to build and expand grows and inbreaks in our world today on earth as it already is in heaven. To close out, I'll, I'll quote Dr. Tim when he says, I am convinced that a church that does not preach the triune God, even if they speak of Jesus regularly, will eventually lose a proper view of God's true holiness. Indeed, to most people today, a sense of awe comes only with the greatest difficulty. For many Christians, God has become domesticated and put in a box so that we can pull him out when we need him. We need to catch a renewed glimpse of the glory and the majesty of the triune God. Friends, one of the things that I hope that you have gained out of this study, and feel free to go back to previous episodes, is a deeper sense of awe and wonder of the God that we profess. Because I think that that leads us into a different way of living. Friends, thank you for watching. Uh, we've got one more episode next Wednesday. And we're going to take a few weeks off, and, or a week off, and then we're going to jump into a new study called 19 Questions to Kindle a Wesleyan Spirit by Dr. Reverend Carolyn Moore, who is also an Asbury alum. And uh, I, I think uh, as we delve into what our Methodist roots are and what it means to be Wesleyan, that this study is going to be a great conversation starter for us. So hopefully that you will join us. I do plan on offering that in person. Uh, we will probably uh, stream it. I'll have the phone going while we, while I talk, or something along those lines. But we'll we will meet in person in the annex both uh, Wednesday morning and Wednesday evening because by that point we will be back in person. Uh, so may you be blessed. May these things cause you to think a whole lot deeper about what we say we believe, and may we grow closer to God because of it. I will see you all Sunday morning. God bless.